Hi, I'm Cy Kellett, the host of Catholic Answers Live, the nationally syndicated radio program dedicated to answering any question at all about the Catholic faith. Today we have clips from the show featuring Tim Staples, Jimmy Aiken, Christopher Check, and Father Hugh Barber. They'll answer questions such as, did any disorder exist before the fall? What's the story of Mexico's young saint, Jose Sanchez del Rio? How can we explain confession to a Protestant? And why does Jesus seem to be so harsh with Mary in the Gospels? Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. Father Hugh Barber, I am a little concerned about Jesus' relationship with Mary. He seems harsh with her often in the Gospels. He doesn't seem to be um, solicitous of her as his mother. And now some people will even say this points out the fact that she is not uh, the important personage that Catholics make her out to be. Why is Jesus so snappy with Mary sometimes? Well, I wouldn't say he's snappy, but he's austere with her Mm -hmm. uh, a bit. Um, If you look carefully, you'll see that, um, for example, at the wedding at Cana, she says, son, they have no wine. And he says, what is it to me and to thee, woman? Yeah. My hour has not yet come, which is a very powerful statement. Because then what happens after is that he does work the miracle, even though he said his hour has not yet come. So right. that shows the power of her intervention. She changes the hour of but, the salvation but, but, of but the he, world. <laughs> but, he, but he gives her this austere answer. Yeah. Or when earlier, when he's found in the temple... He says, why was it you sought me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? It's very, it seems right, very, very dismissive. Very, because, you know, his mother almost reproaches him. He says, how, did you not know that my, your father and I were looking for you sorrowing? And um, then when, it, in several places in the gospel where he's there with his mother and his brethren, he says, who is my mother and my brothers? Yeah. And he points to those around him. Right. A very mortifying answer. And then finally, from the wood of the cross, mother, behold, woman, behold thy son. Uh, which, of course, is a very gripping uh, but painful uh, uh, affirmation, exclamation. I think that um, the theology there is very real. That is that the Lord, when someone is given a particularly close relationship to him in terms of the work of salvation, that they will have to uh, endure in union with him those things which he endured. And so uh, it's not simply all consolation, it's also uh, the fact that the Lord wants true friends who uh, are associated with him, who join him in the struggle, mm-hmm. uh, and not simply those whom he must care for and, and, and nurture. Now, granted, we're all included in that, but in varying degrees. The, the perfect example might be in the, 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 the story of Martha and Mary, where um, Martha complains that Mary is just sitting there while she's doing all the service, and the Lord rebukes her and says, Martha, Martha, you are troubled about many things. One thing only is necessary. Mary has chosen the best, better part, and it will not be taken from her. Now, that doesn't mean that um, Martha was not closer to Jesus than Mary was. What it really means, according to interpreters in the canonical tradition of the Middle Ages and then also the Dominican tradition, um, what it means is that Martha was closer to Jesus, and therefore he held her to a higher standard. Mm-hmm. That is, you should just mortify yourself and wait on everybody, and recognize that your sister Mar- your sister Mary needs special care and consolation, mm-hmm. which you no longer need mm-hmm. because you're working with me for the salvation of the world. Right. And so, so he's kind of treating them almost in a not as equals. I wouldn't say that, but in a way that is very much like companions. Look, right. You're here with me. I get it. And you, it's very, it's and very important, especially the Martha Mary story, because it shows that it's not that you know when you're working in the vineyard that somehow you should feel bad because you're not a contemplative. Yeah. Contemplatives may be the weaker ones that need the ec- extra help from our Lord. Although it's true, objectively, as anyone who's involved in busy pastoral work will recognize. It's much better in and of itself to just be contemplating the Lord. Mm-hmm. And anyone that's a true apostle or someone who's truly engaged in the apostolate will recognize that it's much better to pray. But when the Lord calls us to the, the, the service of our neighbor, that doesn't mean that we're doing a, a less perfect thing. It just means we have to deny ourselves uh, that sweetness of his company in order to serve our neighbor. And I think that's the, the truth of the story. Um, because later on, at least in the Western tradition, where we identify Mary with Mary Magdalene and Mary of Bethany 
at the time of the resurrection, our Lord finally has raised her up to a level where she could be challenged. And when, he, when she tries to cling to him, he says, do not cling to me for I've not yet ascended to my father. So he mortifies her attachment yeah. there. So she re- re- reaches the level of her sister Martha. Yeah. And I think that's a consolation to all the, the uh, hardworking women who feel like they should be like cloistered nuns and recognize that no, no. the Lord may be, may be drawing you closer to himself uh, in your work with your family and your spouses and, and your community. And he doesn't just want you to be someone that he's constantly taking care of. He wants you to be his true friend. True friend. Like that's an even and higher co- calling. Collaborate. Yeah. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong, but original sin seems to imply that disorder wasn't really a thing in the natural world uh, prior to the fall, but it seems clear that a certain degree, at least, of disorder exists, has always existed, uh, even prior to humans. Uh, I'm just wondering if you can shed light on this or some clarification. Yeah, sure. So if we think of disorder in terms of the scientific concept of entropy, entropy is the principle that we observe in nature whereby uh, systems that are, uh, are tightly organized uh, break down and diffuse over time, and energy moves from concentrated states to less concentrated states. And entropy is a fundamental character of our universe in its present state. And the scientific record indicates that entropy has been part of the universe all the way since the beginning. In fact, our whole universe was in a hot, dense state at the time that it began, and subsequently it's diffused from that, and we call that the Big Bang. Um, So the scientific record is certainly on the side of uh, the idea that the universe has always had entropy. The biblical record is also on the side of that. And a lot of people don't notice this, but in even if you even if you want to say the scientific record is wrong and the earth is only 6000 years old and Genesis 1 to 3 are to be taken absolutely literally, they still show that the earth that the earth and the universe was subject to entropy because God creates the stars and including the sun, and sets them shining in the heavens. Well, stars don't shine without entropy, because if there, if you switched off entropy, the energy in the stars, the light and heat, would not radiate out from them from a condensed state to a less dense state. So the mere fact that stars are shining in uh, early Genesis before the fall shows that the universe would have been subject to entropy then, even if you take the text 100% literally. The same thing is indicated by the uh, permission that God gives Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree, uh, or of any tree, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in the garden. That indicates they needed to eat. Well, if you don't have entropy, you don't need to eat because your body doesn't spend energy. You're not processing energy, you're not losing body heat, and so forth. So the fact that Adam and Eve needed to eat would also indicate that the universe had entropy even before the fall. And so the... As a result of that, that shows us that not all disorder was introduced at the time of the fall. Only certain kinds of disorder were introduced at the time of the fall. And uh, theologians, going back to uh, Thomas Aquinas, for example, would say that the specific kind, or one of the specific kinds of disorder that was introduced was human death that humans became subject to death. Previously, God would have used supernatural means of extending our lives, because any natural system like our bodies, due to entropy, will wear down and break down over time unless it's supported by some by something, and God would have supported our bodies in a state of immortality until we fell, and then when we fell, we became subject to death. But we don't have a promise that, or a statement indicating that animals or plants didn't experience death. In fact, the uh, permission that God gives Adam and Eve to eat fruit 
indicates that plants could and did experience death because fruit is the seed pod of a plant. You know, an apple has seeds in it, and then the flesh of the apple is what the seeds are meant to eat once they germinate to, you know, nourish them as they grow into new apple trees. And, um, and so consequently, if you eat an apple... Uh, and the apple was not the forbidden fruit. But if you eat an apple, then you're eating these apple tree embryos. And and they are alive, just like any other kind of embryo is. And then once you digest them, they're not. And so, and the flesh of the apple is no longer alive and so forth. And consequently, um, we know for a fact that it, even on a strictly literal reading that plants would have experienced death and according to theologians like Aquinas and so forth animals would have also because they didn't have the promise of immortality that we did and so it looks like human death is one of the main disorders that entered the world but other kinds of disorder are including death existed in the universe and so consequently the catechism of the catholic church says that by God's design, the universe uh, has always and continues to contain both creative and destructive forces that play out over the course of time until the world reaches its final state, when there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, which will be a radically reorganized uh, form of existence operating under different principles than the present creation. Sure. I've got actually two friends at work, uh, different yes. versions of Protestantism. We were talking about confession, and they brought some verses up to me that uh, um, they believe evidence against um, the Catholic interpretation of confession. Uh, James 5.16, 1 Timothy 2.5, and 1 John 1.9. And sure. then, if you have time, I was talking to them also about the authority of Peter and the founding of the Church. So maybe some sure. extra biblical resources and things that you would recommend on that to, to direct them to. Um, sure. I think we can just get this, you know, verse slinging thing back and forth, but it all <laughs> comes down to us. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting, isn't it, that they would use a text like 1 John 1, 9, because actually that that talks about confession. Now, of course, they're going to say it doesn't mean confession to a a minister. But 1 John 1, 9, we'll back up to verse 8. If any man says he has no sin, he is a liar, and truth is not in him. But if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The first thing you want to point out is that absolutely says nothing against confession. Yeah. A lot of times our Protestant friends, and believe me, I, I'm, I was guilty of it when, when I was Protestant. In my mind, that spoke against confession. Why? Because in my mind, there's no such thing as confessing to a ministerial priest. And so when it talks about confession there, because it doesn't mention a ministerial priest, that means it's denying it. But, you know, you, you could say it this way, that, look, I all the time, I will tell my kids, you know what, this, this Sunday, Lukey, you need to go to confession. You, you really do. You need to confess your sins. Now, I never mentioned a priest there. I never, you know, but am I denying that there's Aye. such a thing as a ministerial priesthood? No. It's in a Catholic context. I'm talking to a Catholic kid. I say, you really need to confess your sins. And the, of course, I'm referring to a priest. So First John 1, 9 in no way denies a priesthood or, or confession. And the same can be said for First Timothy 2, 5. Now, the scripture there says there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Now, of course, the implication here is that, well, because, and by the way, the definition of a priest is a mediator between God and man. That's what a priest is. Hebrews chapter 8, the first three verses, the inspired author of Hebrews mentions as much. A priest offers sacrifice. A priest, you know, is a mediator between God and men. And so, well, if there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ, the implication being, well, then there's no priesthood because he's our only priest. All right, well, let, let me respond to those real quick here. Um, this betrays a false understanding of the nature of the priesthood. Now, think of it, that, and here's one way you can, you can help someone to understand this. Would our Protestant friends say, because Jesus is our one priest, therefore there can be no other priests? Now, they may 
say, well, yeah, he's our one priest, one mediator between God and men, right? Well, what's the problem with that? Well, even our Protestant friends admit 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 through 9 says, we are all priests. We are a nation of priests. In fact, quoting Exodus chapter 19, where um, Moses says that of the ancient people of God, I will make you a kingdom of priests, right? So obviously the fact that all of us, and we as Catholics believe this, we are, by virtue of our baptism, prophets, priests, and kings, we believe in a universal priesthood of the faithful, right? So we are all priests, but we're not all ministerial priests. In this, and this is another way you can respond, is just like in the Old Testament where Moses refers to the people of God as a nation of priests, and yet in that same context of Exodus 19, he then says in verse 22, by the way, that I think that's back in verse 6 where he refers to them all as priests, but then he says in verse 22, let the priests who uh, minister come near to me, right? So he distinguishes the ministerial priests from the universal priesthood even in the Old Testament. Everyone was not an Aaronic priest. Everyone was not a part of the Levitical priesthood, but there was a universal priesthood. In the same way in the New Testament, yes, we are all members of a universal priesthood, but Jesus called specific men out and gave them specific priestly powers. For example, in Luke twenty-two nineteen, 19, do this in memory of me. Do what? Offer the same mass that I'm offering right now. I'm empowering you to go out and do the same thing. I am the one mediator between God and men, and I am going to empower you to be mediators between God and men in me. Not taking away from my unique priesthood, absolutely not, but establishing that one unique priesthood in the earth and this is why we say, along with St. Paul in 2 Corinthians 2.10, the priests in the New Testament act in persona Christi, in the person of Christ. St. Paul says it in 2 Corinthians 2.10, whoever sins I forgave when I was among you, I forgave them in the person of Christ. Again, not taking away from Christ, but establishing that uh, priesthood in the earth. We see another clear example in John chapter 20, verses 21 through 23, after the resurrection. Jesus appears to the apostles. He breathes on them, says, receive the Holy Spirit. Whosoever sins you forgive mm -hmm. are forgiven. Whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. That is a priestly function, just as offering the holy sacrifice here, communicating the forgiveness of God. Jesus himself empowers them to be ministers of reconciliation, to forgive sins. And we see St. Paul doing that, as I mentioned, in 2 Corinthians 2.10, 2 Corinthians 5, verses 17 and 18. St. Paul describes this for us when he says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, all things have become new. All things old are passed away. And this we have received from God, who has reconciled the world to himself in Jesus Christ, and has communicated unto us the ministry of reconciliation. My friend, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, 17 and 18 are plain as day. Now, we could do a lot more here, but that should get you started. Uh, as far as the papacy goes, I, I tell you, I encourage folks, get a hold of my CD set. It's called The Shocking Truth About the Pope and the Bible. I take you through the Bible every which way but loose and show you biblical texts, for example, where Jesus clearly promises the keys of the kingdom to St. Peter in Matthew 16, 18, and 19, right? And I know uh, my Protestant friends, many of them out there are saying, oh, but Jesus didn't make Peter the rock. He made Peter a little tiny rock. Mm, yeah. He is the big, the massive rock, right? Well, that is absolutely false. In fact, even Protestant exegetes today have run in the other direction, from that, yeah. that myth that was created by some of the Reformers, some of the Reformers. I mean, most even Reformed theologians wouldn't go, go there. But the, the bottom line is, no, clearly in Matthew chapter 16, if you go back to verse 13, what is the context there? Jesus asked the apostles, who do men say that I am? And they respond, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, some say you're this prophet, that prophet. Well, who do you say that I am? 
Peter responds, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. President Chris Check, host Cy Kellis. <laughs> you always play that game with me. Uh, uh, Jose, wait, let me, Jose Sanchez Del Rio. Yes. Si. Yeah. Is, uh, is it a feast? Uh, or, or well, we, what do we call it? A memorial? Call memorial. Sure, okay. Sure. Coming Fe- up. February 10th. Yeah. Uh, canonized by Pope Francis in October 2016. Beatified uh, along with other martyrs of the Cristero War by Benedict the 16th in 2005. Uh, so but a, Christ- a great inspiration for, for young boys, especially. Okay, so to, he's an extraordinary young person. He's one of those little miracles, like St. Agnes, just Thir- um, 13 years old. Yeah, so who is, who can, only grace can form a person in the way he was formed by 13 and years old. And two really good parents. And two really good parents, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Co- co- cooperating with Cooperating with grace, yeah. Right, so yeah. his brothers go off to uh, defend Christ in the Cristero Wars in Mexico. Right, so uh, people should know this story because the persecution of the Church is coming again. Um, and in 1917, there was a new Mexican constitution followed by a socialist constitution, many anti-clerical codes, followed by uh, some teeth that was given to the constitution in the enforcement of the penal law in 1926. About the same time, the pope is putting out uh, the document, the the encyclical establishing the the, uh, Feast of Christ the King. And the Cristeros are inspired by this encyclical. In 1927, they declare war on the government of Mexico. Jose Sanchez del Rio is a 13-year-old boy, and he wants to join his brothers in the fight, and his mother says no. Can you imagine a mother saying no to a 13-year-old who wanted to go off to war? <laughs> and he was equipped. I mean, he, he knew he, he grew up on a ranchero, and, uh, or a, uh, and he uh, knew how to ride and take care of horses, clean weapons, and this sort of thing. Uh, so he goes to the local Cristero commander, who also says no. Look, yeah. No. Yes, go home. Right. Boy. Which is a reasonable thing. How That's can a very so- reasonable. He says, how can someone so small uh, help our cause? Right. Um, so, but but Jose is not discouraged. He he rides ten miles to the next town, and he was a, a horseman. He was able to handle horses, right? And, and so that's what he tells the guy. The next right, he, he says, "I I know how to cook in the field. I know how to clean weapons. Uh-huh. Uh, I'm valuable to you." Uh huh. And the general, whose name was Morphine, was uh, taken by the boy's grit. And in fact, so were the other Cristero soldiers. They nicknamed him Tarsicio, right mm-hmm. after the Roman altar boy Tarsicius from the age of the martyrs who died uh, defending the Blessed Sacrament from the Roman mob. So his nickname was Tarsicio, and he was the bugler for the general, General Morphine, and he would ride alongside the general in battle and, you know, bugle out the the orders to the men on the battlefield. And he wasn't afraid because he felt that defending uh, Christ and and, in culture uh, was... Uh, he would go to heaven for his actions. He did indeed, and the, all of the Cristeros, they were fighting for uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, of course, but, but they, were, they were fighting for Christ the King, for the, yeah. for the political and social kingship yeah. of Jesus Christ. Right. Something, yeah. uh, we, I think, we, well, we can be inspired by that, too, that we should be fighting for that a little more. Absolutely. We're a little lazy in that regard. Uh, so what happened to him? Well, there's a battle near a town called Cotija, and uh, his uh, it, 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 Morphine's horse is shot out from under him, and it looks as if he's going to be captured. So Jose gets off of his horse, and he gives it to the general. He says, General, you're more important to the Cristero cause than I am. Take my mount. He helps the general up, and then he gives a swat across the backside of the horse and sends the general galloping to safety, then Jose, 13-year-old boy, picks up his rifle and a bandolier, and he takes a position uh, halfway up a hill behind a rock, and he starts to pick off one by one the federal, the Mexican soldiers who are closing in around him. And at one point, when he runs out of ammunition, of course, he stops firing, he stands up, he said, he says, 
I have stopped firing at you only because I have run out of ammunition. <laughs> I'm not surrendering. That's right. Right. <laughs> okay. Exactly. So they capture him. They do. And they take him to a church that they had turned into a stable mm -hmm. for their horses, a Catholic church that they had turned into a stable for their horses. And uh, uh, adding insult to the desecration, the Mexican soldiers used... Uh, uh, cocks, mm -hmm. uh, uh, roosters, roosters. And, and cockfighting, and they had tethered these to the monstrance of the church. Yeah, so we see what the, the agenda is here. Right. right. It's And Jose scolds them. Uh -huh. uh, and he, they, they lock him up in the sacristy at night. Uh, at, uh, he, he writes a letter to his mother, mm -hmm. which we have. It's extant. And he says, you know, I have no fear going to my death. I look forward to be uniting with my Savior. You know, have, have, have no fear for me. It's very inspiring. And uh, he's able to break free from his bonds one night, and he breaks the necks of all of the roosters. Uh. And he gouges out the eyes of the horses. So uh, they can't uh, use it. Yeah, so, yeah so, they're, so they're useless. Uh, he's tortured brutally. He's first, first, they show him the uh, torture and death of another Cristero soldier, hoping mm -hmm. that he will renounce uh, Christ the King. Instead, he encourages the man. He says, I will be with you in heaven. I know. And, and then uh, well, he's taken, put into a grave after this brutal torture. They walk uh, him across on his bare feet, across the twigs and rocks off. They've, they have skinned the soles of his feet. Yeah. They walk him out, and they do, they're doing this in, in the, in, at night. Uh, and the captain of the guard, he, 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 said, he says to Jose, just say death to Christ the King and save your life. And, and the boy keeps saying, Viva Cristo Rey, Viva, over and over, limping uh -huh. along there on his bloody feet. Viva Cristo Rey, Viva la Virgin of Guadalupe. Yeah, yeah the Guadalupe. And, and he's bayoneted and finally they, shot, and he makes the sign of the cross with his own blood. In the soil there. And, and then is shot a whole bunch more. Yeah. And uh, sent into the arms of his Savior. Praise God and uh, pray for us, uh, Jose Sanchez del Rios. Amen. Thanks for watching Catholic Answers Live TV. Join us each weekday from 3 to 5 Pacific and 6 to 8 Eastern for our live radio broadcast on EWTN Radio. Or join us on the EWTN app. Find more videos and live streams on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash catholiccom. Or find us on Facebook simply by searching Catholic Answers. Jesus Christ is the light of the nations, and we'll see you next week on Catholic Answers Live TV.